Great. Hi, everyone. This is Chase Glenn with the Alliance for Full Acceptance, and we are live here today, going live and having a conversation with Rabbi Greg Cantor from KKBE Jewish Congregation here in, in Charleston, and we are looking forward to having a chance to have a conversation with folks today. So as you are able, we're getting some viewers that are coming on, and we're just kind of going live out here to Facebook. Um, feel free to um, to share this on your own personal page. You should see, um, you know, a chance to to host a watch party. Um, if you're if you're seeing the video right now, feel free to do that, and we get more people out here to see the video. Um, you know, even as we do this here today, it'll be saved. Obviously, you can view the video here in our. In our Facebook videos, we'll also be putting it on YouTube, uh, so you'll be able to have a chance to access this and share it with folks. So, uh, Again, this is Chase Glenn from the Alliance for Full Acceptance, and we are getting started um, here in just a bit. So I will allow people to, to take a few moments and join, and, um, and then we'll go from there. So again, uh, we are going to be joined today by Rabbi Greg Cantor, and... Um, and we will get started in just a moment. Thank you so much for joining us. All right. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and jump into this. Um, again, this is Chase Glenn with the Alliance for Full Acceptance. I'm executive director of AFA. Um, you know, we've been around in this community in Charleston, South Carolina, since 1998, and um, our work really centers around education and advocacy, and so much of that work is about creating these opportunities for conversation and discussion, um, and really, you know, starting these conversations around the issues affecting LGBTQ community, but I, but I always hesitate to say issues, because really it's just about sharing the experiences of LGBTQ folks. And when people hear stories and, and understand the experiences of LGBTQ people um, more, then it really opens hearts and minds. And that's what AFA has been about since 1998, which is changing hearts and minds and really working towards justice for LGBTQ folks. So again, thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and bring Rabbi Cantor onto the screen here. Let's see if we can get it on there. Greg, you are on screen. Hello, everybody. <laughs> How's it going? It's going good. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Thank you so much for being here with us today and, and being willing to share your story and, and be a part of what we're doing. Um, it's my pleasure. Greg has um, contributed to a book that has just been published, and, and my understanding, and Greg, I'm going to let you go into more detail as we and to continue the conversation, but the book is is a collection of prayers and and liturgy, Jewish liturgy around um, LGBTQ experience. And and Greg has contributed to this book, and and so I've asked him um, to to share with us um, one of the prayers that you that you contributed. And so that's how we're going to start today's program is um, is with one of those prayers. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Great. Well. Here's a quick look at the cover of the book. It's called Mishkan Ga'ava, Where Pride Dwells. And um, I contributed two of the prayers in this book, and both are on the theme of adoption for uh, parents. The first one is adopting a child, prayer for the beginning of the adoption process. So here's how it goes. Ribono shel olam, sovereign of the universe, may it be your will that I or we become parents to a child in need of a loving home. May you grant us this gift so that we might grow our family and share the love of a Jewish home, Jewish traditions, and Torah with a new generation of your people. May we and our future children become links in the ongoing chain of tradition. Make us worthy parents in your eyes and in the eyes of the children we may raise. Grant us patience and understanding as we begin the path to adoption. May our efforts be blessed. May a child in need 
find love and shelter in our home. May your light shine in our home, and may our love make a family. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu, Ribon haolam hamechin mitzadei adam. Blessed are you, Adonai our God, sovereign of the universe, who guides our steps. Well, that's that's beautiful. Thank you so much for for sharing that. So talk to us about that prayer and um, you know, just just talk to us about that and, and where that came from in you. Sure. Well, um I am an adoptive dad and um when we adopted there was nothing I could turn to like this. My kids are now um, both sixth graders. And since there was nothing quite like this, um, I had to imagine myself again at that time when we were beginning the adoption process. It's a fairly nerve wracking process. Um, It can take a long time. It can be there can be ups and downs. It's a bit of a roller coaster to adopt, especially at the time in Florida. Um, it was technically illegal for LGBT people to adopt, um, so we had to find a way around that. And so I imagined all those things because some of those things are still realities for LGBT people and uh, sat down and that's what came out. Oh. Well, that's, um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. So let's, let's back up. You've, you've talked a little bit about your journey to becoming an adoptive parent, but let's talk about sort of your journey, you know, early in life, your upbringing, um, parents, where you grew up, that sort of thing. Tell us, tell us a little more about that. Sure. I was um, uh, raised in St. Louis, Missouri, and in, you know, middle class suburb. I went to public school. Um, There were uh, a a pretty good percentage of uh, uh, Jewish students uh, at the school. And so I had uh, lots of Jewish friends growing up and lots of non-Jewish friends as well. And um, so uh, I went to, I was very involved in everything at my temple as growing up. Um, That started just with Sunday school. I remember, especially around the fourth grade, I started really liking everything at Sunday school. And then as I got older each year, there became more opportunities for me to get involved in things at my temple. So I could join the youth group as I got a little older. Then I could be an assistant teacher in the religious school after my bar mitzvah and my confirmation. And then I could actually become a teacher. So I was as involved as I could possibly be. Um, I loved it. Um, My parents were divorced. So my mom worked full time, saw my dad on the weekends. So in in a way, uh, Temple was kind of a refuge for me. And it was a great place. I to where I made some of my best friends um, and uh, still have friends from there now. And it's what eventually inspired me to become a rabbi. So uh, one of the things I did um, as high school was ending was I got involved in overnight Jewish summer camp and uh, enjoyed that so much. And there are so many rabbis who come through the overnight Jewish summer camp as teachers throughout the summer that that was probably what began to get me get my head in a space where I could imagine myself doing it. I think as a little kid, I put the rabbis on a pedestal and never imagined that I could do what they do. 
but once I saw so many different rabbis, men and women, and from all kinds of backgrounds and with different specialties and interests um, at summer camp, then I thought maybe this is something I could do. And one of my, the year of summer camp after I graduated college, um, I decided to apply for rabbinical school. And here I am. <laughs> well, that's, um, I, I don't know if you know, if we've even talked about this, but we share some Midwestern roots. Um, I grew up in Illinois, right across the river, about an hour and a uh, hour or so away from St. Louis. And um, so go Cardinals. I don't know if you're still, if you're a Cardinals <laughs> fan, but <laughs> we can connect on that. Um, sure. um, so, so, I mean, that that's, uh, tells us a lot about sort of your experience of, of, of growing up in St. Louis and and so once you did sort of have this under well let's let's stop i'm going to start here somewhere else you you're gay you've talked about yeah. that <laughs> um at what point in your life were you coming to terms with that and sort of understanding that part of who you are was it at the same time was it after what when did that sort of play out for you so um I was, uh, I graduated college in 87, and then from 87 to 88, I was applying to rabbinical school, and then I got accepted, and it was my last year of rabbinical school, a, a five-year program that uh, I was coming out to myself and beginning to come out to others as well. So that was closer to 1992, 1993. And it was about the same time that the my whole class who were getting ordained at the same time as me were applying for our first jobs as rabbis. So as soon as um, I had an understanding of my identity as a gay man, um, I knew I had to do something about it to uh, understand it better and also make it work with my plan to have a career as a rabbi. So I was a uh, rabbinical school. The fifth year was in Cincinnati, Ohio. And that's where the Reform Rabbinical School, Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, one of their campuses is there, and that's where I studied. And I found a coming out support group at the University of Cincinnati at the time. It was, they were just signing people up for this group, which I thought was perfect for me at the time. I also was a little anxious and nervous um, because, again, I was just starting to come out and deal with these things. And um, I had imagined that I would be the oldest person in this coming out group. So, you know, I was, I think, maybe 28 or 29 at the time. And as it turned out, I was one of the youngest people in the group. And so that was a big surprise to me, but I, it was terrific. It was run by one of the faculty in the psychology department at the University of Cincinnati, and he was great. And he so he ran a great group and gave us all opportunities to learn from each other and um, helped us explore uh who we were, and um, I really, that group made a huge difference in my life. I was also applying for jobs, um, and I, so one of the things I did was I um, called, so remember this is 1992 or 1993, so technology was a lot different at the time. Um, but I called on the phone any 
LGBT rabbis I could identify, and there were maybe enough out ones on one hand that you could count on one hand for me to identify. So I tried to call all of them to ask about their experience and their advice for a young student rabbi about to be ordained who's interviewing for jobs. And none of them gave me advice, but they all shared with me their experience. So what I learned from those phone calls was at that time in 1993, not a single out gay or lesbian or bi or trans rabbi had been hired by a, a congregation. Um, those who did have jobs um, got them while they were still in the closet and then later came out. Um, and um, some of them uh, were fired and went on to start their own congregations and others got jobs in uh, different parts of the field, maybe not at congregations, but alternative kinds of things. And so none of them wanted to give me advice. They wanted me to just hear about their experience and then make my own decision. They didn't want to make that decision for me. Um, and I respected that. And so coming to the conclusion from my conversations with those rabbis, I decided I was not going to come out in my interviews at the time. And then I would interview, get the job at the best congregation that I could, and then work there. And after, like these other rabbis who had successfully kept their jobs, after the congregation got to know me and like me, um, then I could come out and um, hopefully they would keep me at the job. Um, so I got a job at a large congregation in Minneapolis, Minnesota. They had 2,100 households at the time, and I was the fourth of four rabbis on the staff. Um, began there in the fall of 93, and while I was there, um, uh, I also found a therapist so I could continue to have some of the benefits of therapy that I had in my coming out group in Cincinnati. Um, and in a few months, I found myself so miserable by trying to be in the closet. And in addition to miserable and perhaps even more important than being miserable, uh, or maybe directly related to my being miserable was I, I felt inauthentic. And as a rabbi, um, it just couldn't work for me being inauthentic and being miserable, having no social life and um, not being fully honest and upfront about my identity. So while I wanted to wait at least a year or so for them to get to know me and fall in love with me as their rabbi, after a few months, um, I decided I couldn't wait any longer. And so I came out to the senior rabbi. Remember, again, there were four rabbis, including me, and the, se the senior rabbi was really the boss. So I came out to uh, him because I thought, well, if this, if there's any chance that I will keep my job, um, I got to have him on board. So I wanted to start with him and make sure he knew that um, I was sort of looking for him to take the lead about what this would mean for the congregation. While there were certain things that were not negotiable for me, um, uh, primarily that this really did mean that I was going to come out and be myself, um, and that was not negotiable. Um, 
that he could decide how it might be uh, shared with a larger congregation. And so he, the senior rabbi, um, first shared it with the other members of the senior staff. There were two other rabbis, uh, Cantor, and there was a uh, executive director and an, a senior educator. And he decided he wanted to let all of them know first. And I was okay with that. And then I spoke to all of them and they were, uh, I would say basically supportive. They, they weren't um, like my biggest allies ever, but they were, they were supportive. And um, they were supportive of the idea of me keeping the job there. And um, uh, then it came to what do we do to this for the whole congregation to be aware. And the thought of the idea that the senior rabbi was that we would send a letter out. Um, actually, I skipped a step. Before that, um, they called an emergency board meeting at the time to talk first just to the board of KKBE. Uh, not KKBE, this was uh, Temple Israel in Minneapolis. Um, uh, so I don't want, I don't want to mix them up. This is and so they came out. They they told the whole board. The board voted, decided that I would keep my job, and uh, that was a huge relief. And then they decided that the next step would be to send a letter to the entire congregation. So they did, and. As you can imagine, in a major metropolitan area like the Twin Cities in Minnesota, um, the, the newspapers um, and some news outlets got wind of it um, because thousands of letters were going out. And um, there was an article published, uh, Rabbi Outs Himself, and that was in the Minneapolis, uh, I think it's the Star Tribune, and um, then that Friday, which was an, the, the main services at Reform Synagogues, like the ones that I've served, are usually Fridays. Um, that Friday night, uh, it was packed. Everybody came after receiving that letter to hear what I had to say that Friday night. So, and I was giving the sermon. That was also in the letter. Rabbi Cantor is out, he's a gay man, and he'll be giving the sermon this Friday. So if you wanna know more, come. And they did, it was packed. And um, they were overwhelmingly supportive. Uh, the ones who weren't supportive had three other rabbis they could talk to. So. They didn't come to me if they weren't supportive, but a huge amount of this gigantic population that showed up to that first service were supportive. There were people who came with their gay kids, um, and uh, that, as much as anything, made me feel certain that I was doing the right thing because uh, this discord that I was living with while trying to be closeted or really have no life at all outside of my work um, and feeling inauthentic, it was I was confirmed that I was doing the right thing when I saw parents were bringing their gay kids. Um, so and because a rabbi is supposed to be a role model, regardless of whether you're LGBTQ or any other part of the spectrum. A rabbi is supposed to be a role model. And um, it finally felt like I could breathe, that I was doing the right thing. Um, I was uh, really doing what I was called upon to do as a rabbi. And um, I, we went on from there. 
Well, I you shared so much there that I I mean all along the way I wanted to just jump in and and <laughs> ask more questions, but I can only imagine, sure. um, you know, and I'll just pause here and say for for those who are just joining us or joined while while um, Rabbi Greg Cantor was was speaking, that's who we have uh, joining us today, Rabbi Greg Cantor from uh, Kahal Kadash Bethel Elohim. Jewish congregation here in um, Charleston, South Carolina, KKBE, for those who, like me, stutter around lots of long words. So KKBE here in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, That's what and, we say to KKBE. Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my past then. I can just say KKBE. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, my, my personal story, not to get too sidetracked on that, but, you know, I was raised Christian, but worked in churches, um, for a number of years and was in the closet. Um, and, um, at, at one point was outed, uh, was serving a church in Florida and was outed on the job, um, and was called into the minister's office and given the option that I could either, um, quit and, you know, leave <laughs> then or, um, I could stay, but I had to go to reparative therapy or conversion therapy or whatever phrase you'd um, you know, care to use, but to get fixed, so to speak, fixed in quotes. Um, and so I could really relate to what you said about this sort of the burden that you were carrying for the, that short time, the few months you said, where you had started this new job and you were not out and... Um, you know, just feeling that you weren't able to be authentic. Um, and that creates such a barrier. And that, that's not just, um, you know, in talking with people and in my own experience, that's that, that sense of inauthenticity, you know, definitely impacts someone who's doing the type of work that you, that you do, um, which is really soul care and, and connecting and that sort of relational work. But I think it affects a lot of people who are you know, who are in the closet, um, sure. just living with that sort of burden of, of not being able to be out. So I can only imagine that first few months was really difficult. And um, the anxiety of not knowing how they would all handle it. But it sounds like, generally speaking, though, your experience was really pretty positive once you did come out, but very public also. Um, the letter to the entire congregation and the, the come here, the, the sermon, <laughs> if you have, you want to hear, hear Greg <laughs> and hear his story, come here, the sermon on Friday. Um, I can imagine that was, that brought its own challenges too, just going from this personal private experience to now it being on the stage, literally. Right. Yeah. It was very public and, um, uh, so, and there were, you know, other steps in between. It was for a while, um, it was a bit of a roller coaster because, you know, we had to see how the reactions would go. And, uh, also I, I, the support I got from my colleagues while at the time I would have described it as amazing was really kind of mixed in some ways. And so I had to navigate a new world and be myself and be out and figure out how to have a social life. I was, at the time I was single and always imagined myself uh, meeting someone and raising a family. And uh, so I couldn't do that while I was in the closet, um, but now I felt like I could do that. So all these things were kind of new to me and challenging. And I just, a lot of it, you just sort of learn by doing. And so I did. And um, I heard about some of the negative criticism, a little of the negative criticism that came back to the other rabbis. I got a lot of the positive criticism sent directly to me in letters and emails and phone calls and visits. Um, shortly after I came out, um, uh, there was uh, a, gay, a young gay man in the community who was dying of AIDS who had heard my story and asked me to come visit him 
and get to know him and asked me to be the officiant at his funeral. Um, that was another thing that reassured me that I was absolutely doing the right thing, that um, I was, you know, I have a multifaceted identity. I'm Jewish, I'm gay, I'm a man, I'm from the Midwest, um, college educated, um, and I needed to blend all these things and I needed to <clears throat> stand up as a rabbi in the Jewish community and as a gay man in the LGBT community. And so when this man uh, called upon me, I got to know him. And shortly after when he died, it felt like the biggest honor in the world um, at the time that I could officiate for his service. Wow, that's so, um, that's really powerful, and I think the um, I mean at that time you're talking early '90s, right? Is that what you said? Yep. Around, yeah, yeah, and that was there was such an incredible stigma um, against those who um, had AIDS, HIV, and AIDS, and for that man to have um, a person from his faith community, a leader, a rabbi in his faith community, be able to validate and sort of affirm him. And um, I can imagine that was really powerful. Um, yeah, uh, <clears throat> absolutely. So I was coming out in the 90s, but I was also making friends, um, men and women who had been out for a much longer time, uh, including people who, through the 80s, lost a lot of friends. And um, they these people were like uh, pe uh, uh, veterans. Uh, from a war and they were just crushed by all the loss they had experienced um, due to HIV and AIDS and um, I got to be the, their rabbi as well and um, so that just added even more to uh, confirming that what I was doing by being myself and being authentic was a uh, absolutely the right thing to do well i would be remiss if i didn't tell you you're receiving a lot of love in the comments here and um we've got i'll put a few on the screen for you uh your um your congregation right now we adore you rabbi Cantor. you're the best and we're lucky to have you um so that's that's really wonderful and let's see here we've got uh, robin daly or dudley i'm sorry robin dudley um, saying, hoping your family as well, and um, and then also uh, Jewish Community Relations uh, Council of Greater Charleston also saying thank you for sharing your story. Oh, wonderful. Well, so, I, I know those people and love those people, and a lot has happened since I first came out in Minneapolis and then ended up here in Charleston, but one of the things I decided when I came out was that I would never interview for another job in the closet, that um, uh, they would know that I'm a gay man before they hired me, because um, I just could never ever do that again after having done it once, and it was inauthentic and unpleasant. So um, every job I've had since then, um, I've been putting all my cards on the table um, during the interview process so that people knew what they were getting. And um, it's still, you know, uh, uncertain thing. I still hear today about my colleagues, uh, LGBT colleagues who may interview for a job at a place and when they come out to them as a part of the interview, um, then they might hear back, oh, sorry we're not interested but kkbe has been amazing and wonderful and the charleston jewish community is amazing and wonderful they welcome me um, my whole family my husband our children and this feels like home for me and we really love it here well that's awesome let's talk a little bit about that you came from um is it south florida uh, yeah. Before you came here, okay. And so let's talk about um, the differences 
in um, South Florida um, and serving there and coming to Charleston, South Carolina. Did you ever think you would be um, in the heart of the South, Charleston, South Carolina, a, a city like this? I really, it, it was not in my imagination of where my career was going to take me. Although I had, as a student rabbi, served a lot of very small congregations in the South, in Mississippi, Tennessee, and Louisiana. Um, and my own father was born in Alabama. So I wasn't completely unfamiliar with the Jewish community in the South, but I didn't necessarily imagine myself. Uh, being here. But um, after leaving Minneapolis, I went to South Florida. And I don't know if you can call South Florida the South. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think the northern part of the state is more the South than South Florida. Um, but uh, when I came here, I just loved it from the first time I came to visit for an interview um, to ever since. Um, so, yeah, like I said, it really feels like home and family for me here. That's awesome. That's great. Well, we're lucky to have you here for sure, um, as noted in the comments. Uh, it's great. Um, so let's bring it to, to present day and, um, you know, our, our current reality um, of being in the midst of a global pandemic um, COVID-19, many of us are sheltering in place. You're in your home right now. I'm in my home. Um, and so how are you doing? How are you holding up? How has this affected your life? Well, um, so the temple, we've closed our, uh, our, our temple, except for some business that we still have to do in the office. Um, there's no more services or tours that are done there. We'll, we are looking forward to a time when we will have services there again, um, but we haven't done that. I also now am married and my husband and I have two kids. So we're navigating that in this COVID-19 coronavirus uh, pandemic time. And so um, that's kind of the boring part of my life, uh, just trying to get kids to do their school assignments via technology. And I'm also trying to stay in touch with the congregation. Um, we've got a great program through KKBE where um, I and uh, Rabbi Stephanie Alexander, who's the senior rabbi, and other members of the senior staff reach out every day to our members uh, via technology. Um, if, if and when we identify someone who needs a phone call, we get in touch. Um, we're doing lots of our meetings via Zoom, sort of like this. Um, and so it's a different world. Nothing like this has happened in our lifetime and we're just trying to navigate it. We're creating uh, services for the Sabbath that go out every week. Um, we call it Shabbat and we each do a part of those. And uh, one of our senior staff, our music director, Robin Schuler, who's amazing, um, she takes our little video clips and puts them together for a Shabbat service. And then we have a live Tat Shabbat via Zoom with everybody at home, including me. And um, I participate in other activities. I've done my, I teach a class for eighth and ninth graders that uh, we've done a lot on Zoom. Tonight, we're having a a special meeting where we're going to give them all, uh, or it's, it's our last class tonight, so we're inviting them all to come by and we're uh, going to be delivering uh, pizza from D. Alessandro's Pizza to all of our students. Thank you, DLs. They're amazing. And um, then we'll, everyone will go home with their pizza and then we'll have a final Zoom pizza party for our eighth and ninth grade class. They're amazing kids, my eighth and ninth graders. 
a lot has changed since when I was an eighth or ninth grader, and um, there was no one really talked about being LGBT unless it was in the context of bullying. Um, th it seems like a lot has changed. It's not perfect. There's a lot of work to do, and I'm here to help uh, be a role model and help do the work for kids today. Um, but it's come a long way since when I was a kid, and no one even talked about uh, being gay. Um, and I forgot exactly where I was going with all of this, but <laughs> that's that's the description of how we're navigating this uh, coronavirus pandemic era. Well, I, you had the shout out there, the D'Alessandro pizza. Uh, ben was on my watch on my personal page, and he said hi earlier, so then I oh, can great. plug that in there. So <laughs> Ben has been he he's a past board member at KKBE. He was on the board when I first arrived, and he's. He and his business have been hugely generous uh, to KKBE, and um, I'm just so grateful for that. Yeah. Well, so we we know that, and we sort of touched on this in each of the um, you know, virtual conversations that we've hosted here in the last month and a half. Um, we know that often the people who are um, most greatly impacted in times of crisis are those who are already vulnerable, people who are already parts of, of marginalized um, communities. And, and, um, and so, you know, just speak, speak to us from, you know, the perspective of your faith and what your faith tells you when people are going through struggles, and it could be any number of struggles that people are experiencing right now, economic hardship, emotional um, you know, struggle being at home, depression, anxiety, uh, just general physical exhaustion from having to do all the different things that everyone ha has to do right now to sure. kind of maintain our <laughs> regular lifestyle. What comfort do you find in your faith? What is your faith? How does your faith inform uh, you in moments like this, what can you share with us uh, uh, sort of along sure. those lines? Well, I am fortunate and blessed to not only be Jewish, but to be part of Reform Judaism. Reform Judaism is the largest, most progressive movement of Judaism and is extremely inclusive officially of LGBT people, of uh, same-sex marriage, and of LGBT rabbis. So uh, not, not every movement is as good. Um, conservative movement is uh, doing a pretty good job. And um, I have some wonderful Orthodox colleagues who are supportive, but sometimes the uh, Orthodox uh, branch of Judaism, it can be a lot like uh, fundamentalist Christians sometimes. Not always, but um, sometimes they can be not accepting. So um, I turn to tradition to find support for LGBT people and for, like you said, anybody who's in need of spiritual support. In terms of support for LGBT people, um, it's it so I look at stories in the Bible and other Jewish texts that I think could support LGBT people. The most prominent, but not the only one, but the most prominent is certainly the story of Joseph. Uh, Joseph was the youngest of many brothers. His brothers hated him. They tried to kill him. Um, and they um, looked down upon him because he wore fancy clothes. I think uh, that's something a lot of gay people can relate to. We sometimes dress differently. Um, we sometimes are rejected by our family and friends. They some, sometimes tell us they're dead to us. And there are literally countries in the world where um, LGBT people could get killed for coming out to their family. So the story of Joseph is something a lot of gay people who are coming out can relate to. But the story goes on um, where 
after they sort of kick him out of the family, decide not to kill him and sell him into slavery, he becomes a huge success, a powerful man um, with a lot of influence in Egypt at the time. And his family comes back to him. They don't even recognize him because he's grown and changed so much and they never imagined that the little kid they kicked out of the family would grow up to be uh, a powerful man in Egypt. And when they come back to him, um, they don't recognize him, but they come begging for support. And he has this huge emotional moment where he comes out to them and tells them, not that he's gay, but that he is Joseph, their son, their brother. And... Um, I think a lot of gay people can relate to that, where uh, after having been rejected by family and friends, we go on to make our own families and our own lives, and we become successful. And uh, I can't tell you how many people I've met who were rejected by their family, but when they became parents, and then that meant their parents became grandparents, their parents started to soften up and come around. And so in many ways, we can relate to stories like Joseph's story in the Bible. It speaks to us. Well, that's, yeah, that's powerful. That's really a, a powerful way to look at that story. And that's a story I'm familiar with as well. So that's, thank you for sharing that. Um, sure. So as we're closing up here, we're getting close to, to the one o'clock hour. Um, couple, two things I want to do before we, before we let you go. Uh, one, when we're talking about, and you sort of already went there with that story, um, but if you're talking to um, a young LGBTQ person, someone maybe who's even just coming to terms with that in them they may are not may, may not be owning that that identity uh, but they're really just sort of walking through that and trying to um you know so, sort of struggling through that not necessarily struggling because it's a bad thing but just because when you're going through personal things it can be a challenge um what message do you have um for any young person right now who is looking for um you know some some hope in the midst of sort of working through that part of their, their journey? Well, uh, I've given this message not to LGB, not just to LGBT kids, but to my entire eighth and ninth grade class every year that I've been teaching here, um, that they need to be authentic and true to themselves. Um, I mostly live uh, by example. So while um, other people come with their spouses of the opposite sex, um, I come with my husband to services. Um, we bring our children. Um, so I try to live mostly by example, but I've also spoken directly to my eighth and ninth grade class about my experiences coming out and being a gay rabbi and how that's changed over time and how I think it's important for them to be authentic and true to themselves, not just um, in terms of their identity, or uh, sexual identity, um, but also their gender identity um, for trans kids who are growing up and struggling with that, for what they like and what they're interested if they want to be artists if they want to be writers if they want whatever they want to do i want them to be comfortable in their own skin and i think that's my job as a rabbi i need to lead by example um so i always am conscious of that all the time i think that's true for every rabbi um but it has special meaning for my LGBT colleagues out there um, who know that there are kids who struggle. We want them to know that um, it's safe to come talk to us. Um, and, and if they don't feel like talking about their sexual identity, they, 
we, we still want them to know it's safe to come talk to us about whatever is going on in their lives. That's really important for every person who belongs to a synagogue or a church or a mosque or other religious affiliation. They should feel like they can be authentic and be themselves when they talk to their clergy. That's true for me. And um, I'm, I think it's important in my uh, part of my job in helping to raise a, another generation of uh, Jewish people who are healthy adults and comfortable in their own skin and lead the kind of lives that they want to lead. That's uh, thank you for saying that, and thank you for sharing your story. I mean, that's really why we're doing these sorts of programs. Again, just that when you talk about being authentic and being able to just be yourself, so much of that is you know when you hear other people um, being able to be themselves and sharing their full selves. It, there is something, there's some power in that. That um, a lot of times people, you know, I know my experience have been able to reflect that back. Uh, to people. When I see someone else being authentic and real and sharing their story, it then emboldens me to do the same. Um, so thank you for, for doing Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not lost on me how important that is and how clergy of any kind have this responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I, it's part of my job and maybe sometimes the most important part of my job. Yeah, the, I mean, when you're talking about clergy and um, the power to, to hurt and the power to do such good. And, and so in this moment, thank you for doing such good um, in, in our world and, and bringing so much to this community. Um, as we are closing up, um, two things. One, I'm going to put um, Rabbi Cantor's email here on the screen. He wanted me to make sure that I, oh, that's not your email. That is a donation link. We'll give you an actual <laughs> email address there. Um, <laughs> that, um, uh, you know, if anyone wants to reach out um, and talk to you about anything, obviously, but, you know, you've shared a lot today and someone may feel like, wow, I really wish I had an opportunity to um, to talk to him more. This is your email address and, and feel free. People are welcome to reach out. Um, Absolutely. I'd love to hear from you, all of you, Jews, non-Jews, LGBT people, parents who are trying to help navigate the world for their kids, um, and, uh, and or just people who want to talk to a rabbi. That's always part of my job. I help people convert to Judaism and not just LGBT people, but all people. And um, so save that email address, reach out to me, and let me know how I, how KKBE can be there for all of you. That's what we do for Charleston, and it's really important. That's awesome. Thank you. So as we're closing up, I uh, wanted to invite you to share another um, one of the prayers that you had published in, in the book. And share that book again here so everyone sure. can see. Um, okay. So the book is called in hebrew it's mishkan ga'ava in english it's where pride dwells and it's got sort of this rainbow pride flag uh background on the cover it's available at amazon and also at ccarpress.org and uh, the first prayer i read at the beginning of our meeting was about people beginning the adoption process that took a couple years for us and at the end we have two beautiful children and the second prayer i wrote is for a blessing after completing the adoption process and here's how this one goes ribono shel olam sovereign of the universe mother and father to us all May we be like Mordechai, who raised a child to be brave and sensitive. May we be like Pharaoh's daughter, who raised a child whose leadership has served all of humanity. May we be like Naomi, who adopted the son of her daughter-in-law and raised him in anticipation of the coming of a messianic age. Ribono Shalom, sovereign of the universe, Parenthood is a journey fraught with perils and mystery. 
Help us navigate the rough waters with wisdom, love, and patience. Help us to embody the highest virtues of those who came before us and to pass those qualities along to our child and children. May our family always be worthy of your Torah and your blessings. Baruch Atavanai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shechianu V'Kiyamanu V'Higianu Lazman Hazeh Blessed are you, Adonai our God, Sovereign of the Universe, who enriches our life with new life, sustains us and our families, and brings us to joyous occasions. Amen. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us and sharing time with us today and being a part of this conversation. We're so grateful to have you in our community and, and, um, and grateful to have you as an AFA supporter and um, and grateful for the time that we got to spend with you today. Um, I you know just want to just touch on a couple other things here before we go. Thank you everyone who joined us today. Again, my name is Chase Glenn. I'm the executive director of the Alliance for Full Acceptance, uh, an LGBTQ social justice organization here in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, we've been doing a number of these programs. We have uh, a few more booked out, and we're planning to keep going here. This, this has created a really wonderful opportunity for us. Um, and I think what a lot of people have experienced is um, in times of having to do some things that maybe we weren't prepared to do, like shelter in place and uh, quarantine and watch our children while we're working full time and doing things like that, it's also opened up um, some some positive things um, and um, and for AFA it's opened up some creativity and how we're doing programming and being able to offer this so thank you for joining us everyone and um, tomorrow night six o'clock Thursday night six o'clock we're gonna do a program here with um, several local drag queens and we're gonna talk about the history of drag in Charleston drag then and now uh, talk about how um, this often subver subversive art form um, kind of plays into our current political and social climate and, and the place for, um, for drag and the importance of drag in the, in the LGBTQ community. So we'll be having that conversation at 6 o'clock tomorrow night. Next Wednesday uh, at 6 o'clock, uh, we'll be hosting E. Patrick Johnson, who is an artist and scholar from Northwestern University. Um, who has written uh, several books on being Black and queer in the South and um, collecting stories of folks who are Black and queer in the South. And he will be reading from one of his plays, and then we'll have a, a conversation, a sort of moderated conversation with him after that. It's going to be a really incredible program, and we're so lucky to be able to have him joining us. Uh, there are other things on, on the docket, and we'll be sharing those as we get more details nailed down. But um, we're really working to try to um, provide some programming that's not only about topics that are especially timely right now, um, but also, you know, just engage with the community in ways that we haven't before. So, um, you know, we don't expect everyone to be able to donate, but we want to, um, of course, share that, you know, we will be grateful for your support. If you're able to make a contribution, uh, whether it's a one-time contribution or a monthly gift and to help sustain our work throughout the year, we would be absolutely grateful um, for, for your support. The uh, link there to go to our website, you can you can make a donation there. And, and, and if you're willing to do that, if you appreciate what we're doing, the work that we do in the community and we will continue to do, um, we would, of course, be grateful for, for your support in that way. Um, and with that being said, uh, thank you again to Greg, and thank you to everyone who, who watched us uh, today, and we will see you all again soon. Please take care. <laughs>